All right, so we are recording now. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another meeting of our CNCF uh, End User Research Group. Um, today we'll have a nice presentation from Diego about uh, using uh, the interlink uh, setup to schedule uh, pods on Slurm. Uh, he will give us all the details about that. We will just start with a quick round of presentations. So if you have, um, if you're in uh, first for the first time with us, um, please, we'll give you the time to present yourself. So I see Doug Van Aurov. First time, do you wanna say a couple of words? Hi, yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, you can call me Norval. It's quite uh, and uh, I'm uh, a master student in uh, Grenoble, and I'm writing my thesis at Eviden, uh, previously known as Etos, uh, on the topic of integration in Kubeflow with uh, HPC. So I came here to like to get some ideas to meet with people. Amazing, amazing. Welcome. Thank you. And we have Alan from SkateMD as well. Yeah, hello. Um, it's the first time I just started at SketMD uh, about a week ago. So um, thanks for uh, having me. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Uh, and welcome as well. So I will wait, Diego, is it the first time? Second time. OK. I don't know if we did the round uh, last time. I was checking the names. Do you want to present yourself as well, Diego, just in case? Ah, wait, I need to give you voice. Let me fix that. Still need to figure this out. So Diego, do you want to say a couple of words? Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Hello, it's uh, Diego Bakin. It's the first, second time for me that I participated to this talk. I participated uh, me with uh, other two colleagues of uh, Do It System to the last talk. So okay. awesome. we, are, we are very interested in this, uh, this topic. Thank you. Amazing. Welcome. And uh, did I, is there anyone that we don't have in the list yet that uh, is here for the first time? Do come uh, forward. Yep. Me, I'm here for fifth time. Jose. Jose, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, feel free to add your name in the in the agenda, but go ahead. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm Jose from Spain. I was working at a company called uh, HPC Now, and I'm here because in the past months, we are researching a little bit about uh, batch scheduling against uh, Kubernetes. And I have a, a small experience playing with QA and some other components, and I researched a little bit uh, the topic on different projects, etc. So I'm here because I'm quite curious about uh, what you have to me. Awesome. Welcome. And we have two more. We have Camilla. Can you hear us? All right, then we can go to Rohini. Welcome, uh, Rohini. Always first question, can you hear me okay? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay, um, great. Rohini, um, um, yeah, technically my first time uh, as this, this format here, but um, maybe some of you may have seen me at, at the, the rug booth uh, at the last KubeCon. Um, um, up in recently was working for the SK Observatory, now working the Swiss part of the SK project um, and uh, relation with an HPC facility here in Switzerland at CSCS. And so we have yeah, a good, good amount of interest in um, this uh, area that sort of aligns with the SK Observatory's interests as well. Amazing. Welcome. Well, we know each other, but yeah, welcome. And I see Pablo. Uh, that's a familiar name, Pablo. Hey, hey, Ricardo. How are you? <laughs> Yeah, my first time here today, although I know some of you already. Um, I'm also, I'm working with Rohini actually on the um, SKA project. Amazing. Well, welcome. I think uh, we are okay for the routing of introductions. Um, if we miss someone, 
just feel free to speak up. Um, and before we pass to Diego, I was just going to say uh, we have already uh, one more session scheduled in this area for the 15th of May. You can check in the agenda um, around Volcano and the uh, batch scheduling with Volcano. Uh, we will schedule another one. We're still preparing around Carmada for uh, sort of multi-cluster multi uh, support. And uh, we have an empty slot for May 1st. So either we take Armada there, but it's, uh, it's probably better to present after Volcano, uh, or we might have an empty slot. So if you have ideas, uh, please uh, reach out. Uh, it could be interesting also to have an update on Q. So we could, we could uh, ask them to give a quick update on May 1st. But if you have other ideas, just, uh, just propose them. And with this, I will stop sharing. And I will pass the word to Diego, uh, who will talk us, to us about Interlink. So thank you very much, Diego, again, for presenting. And go ahead. Yeah, thank you for having me. So yeah, OK, the idea with this presentation is to uh, propose a bit of uh, a summary of what can be achieved with Interlink and why we are evaluating and developing su such a tool uh, that I'm presenting just in a, in a few minutes. Um, just one uh, disclaimer here. Uh, I'm being focusing on uh, HPC, how to deploy on, on HPC CentOS, let's say, but uh, I have some uh, some detail at the end where this can be extended also to any remote resource. So this is the reason for, for this title referring to remote resources. But OK, let's dive in for the moment. Um, starting from uh, who are uh, we in this uh, uh, development and investigation, you can see here uh, I have to thank a, a bunch of people first. And also notice that it's not really just a, a single institute working on this, it's kind of, uh, of a teamwork made possible through the project that I'm presenting very briefly here in the first slides. So starting from where I'm employed, actually, I'm a technologist at INFN and ICSC, meaning that there are you know, two kind of uh, domain of science that uh, the we need to, to serve. The first one is uh, INFN, that is the National Institute uh, for Nuclear Physics in Italy. And you can see that we have different kind of area inside this domain, but every single one of them need to access resources of some kind. And these resources are not only distributed all over Italy, as you can see in this small plot on the bottom, but they are also different in how they are managed. So there are cloud resources, uh, and there are on-prem resources. There are also uh, batch resources that are not Solurum, for example. So they are HT Condor uh, and used for more classical, well, let's say, distributed computing at LHC, for example. And also, we have a supercomputer in Italy, and we will have uh, more kind of HPC centers. And this is pushing the challenge to, to the next level. So how we can manage to have a common interface for people developing their, their stuff and doing science, uh, and not only physics, but science, meaning we have uh, here for the ICSC, that is the National Center of Supercomputing, uh, a lot of different uh, chemical, um, geophysics, um, quantum computing, whatever, needs to share the common infrastructure. So we need kind of, uh, now abstraction that allow us to say, okay, this is our entry point and all the other magic appears. Uh, it's transparent to you. You don't need to, to care about how to your payload is distributed over this infrastructure. And um, yeah, this is the, the beginning of the challenge and what really put a boost in this direction was the participation to the Interteam project that is a, a European project that uh, aimed to create a digital twin engine. The digital twin engine mean, meaning a platform that has to serve uh, as a distributed uh, computational hub 
for creating and developing digital twins. So in different areas, that's starting from uh, physics, for example, replicating a twin, a digital twin of a detector, for example, but also to replicate a model for fluid uh, disaster or whatever kind and so on and so forth. So multidisciplinary area and that needs to access HPC centers that are also fortunately part of this consortium, part, part of this uh, activity. And this is really the key for what we achieved so far. All these infrastructures that I'm mentioning, so starting from the grid one, so the batch on HD Condor, but also passing to this supercomputer area, often enough produce this kind of problem for us. So produce a restricted area where we cannot uh, envision to deploy anything that is uh, similar to a real Kubernetes node. And we need Kubernetes for uh, a simple fact, as you may imagine. The frameworks that are uh, being de developing for the future of the uh, each one of the science domain that I presented briefly before needs it's compatible with Kubernetes APIs. So we really uh, strive to have an abstraction that starts below the Kubernetes API layer. So the idea essentially is to serve this black box that does the following. So we started with these three main uh, scenario in mind. So starting from the first one, we envision, for example, machine learning data science pipeline in general, arriving to the point where you interact with Kubernetes PI. And then the, this black box should be able to offload what you request from that framework into something running on the GPU node, for example, on the HPC center, and then return you back the results that you need. Same for serverless or event-driven computing, if you want. I know data, new data are av available. I want to trigger a pipeline that goes into specialized hardware uh, or, or into specialized node for a new training uh, uh, of my model, for example. And the most challenging one is also the one that foreseen a backward connectivity from the node. It's a bit tricky. We have a proof of concept for this, and I show you uh, how it behaves. But the idea is that, again, I have a, a Jupyter Hub, for example, or IML Flow uh, Hub, whatever, that delegate the payload that, in, in this case, is a simple uh, Jupyter Lab instance, for example, and it distributes this into a remote node and connect back to the hub for the user to access them through the uh, web interface. So these are the three scenarios that we have in mind. And all in all, what rang a, a bell in the past where we was we were thinking about this is that somehow we have this kind of abstraction already in place, thanks to the virtual kubelet components. And so the idea was, OK, let's give a first try to this kind of approach, where I have my Kubernetes cluster with a virtual node that behaves like a, a normal node, but is configured to submit, for example, in the case of Slurm, a Slurm job with a, a container run inside a obtainer or whatever container runtime is disposal at the remote site. Uh, very often, we we never experience with two three centers obtainer or x singularity let's say uh, is the runtime the mo that is most uh, uh, used in the hpc side but okay so i offload in this way the payload to to the node with this kind of magic how good is it so we gave it a try to all the all this flow where this HPC GPU node was actually a real H Euro HPC center that is Vega. I'm talking about it in, in a second. And the idea it was, OK, let's give it a try to what is already in place. And it worked quite well. So we were able to do all the chain with some uh, caveat and with some tweaks, uh, allowing us to do the first very first row proof of concept saying, OK, everything is doable with some caveats. So the, the first 
blocking uh, item for us was that really we have an heterogeneous set of providers. And also when you pass from an, one HPC center to the other, uh, not every slurm is equal to, to the other one. So you have somehow to configure and let the provider be in charge of managing how the offloading of the container works. So, but to do that with a full virtual kubelet implementation, they should be aware of Kubernetes internals. And this is a showstopper in many cases. So we ended up with three main requirements for our uh, approach and for our work on top of virtual kubelet. So creating an abstraction that allow for providers to easily extend the virtual kubelet machinery, allowing also uh, a central maintenance of all the Kubernetes related stuff. So we maintain all that inside a core component and we envision plugins that as just to describe how the container lifecycle is managed. And it will be in charge of the providers. So with this in mind, with this structure in mind, uh, we can summarize this as providing tools to streamline the process of having a virtual kubelet. It's not that it's not possible to do it right now. It's that our um, concern is about letting the providers do what they want uh, in terms of managing container on, at their sites. So in a certain sense, we want to lower the barrier for new providers to enter and say, OK, you can use my resources through a Kubernetes API. And so to achieve this, um, really um, uh, from 10 kilometer far, we develop a virtual kubelet, a particular uh, provider, if you want to call it like that, uh, of a virtual kubelet that is uh, split in two components. The first one is the Kubernetes core, so where you ma maintain all the uh, state machine for reports, uh, logs, requests, uh, delete, apply, and so on and so forth. And then this part will talk through a standard, or let's say a fixed API spec to a remote counterpart. That is the one that will be called plugin or sidecar uh, with uh, interchangeable terms in the next of the presentation. So you have this remote part that should be in charge of managing the, the container lifecycle. All the Kubernetes part is uh, separated from that. So that uh, is, is the idea. And But before diving into the components and what they does and, and take a look quickly to what we, we achieve, uh, there is this is not a cyber parlance, of course. We are interested for our use cases in very particular payloads that can avoid to rely on intra-cluster network uh, communication. So for instance, uh, you should not assume that you can uh, access a Kubernetes service uh, that is internal to the Kubernetes cluster on the remote. Uh, payload, and also uh, the only volumes that are supported are config map secrets and empty beer for your pods. You cannot share PVC from any other kind. That's the uh, limitation, and here of the the schema of how uh, this work. On the left side, there is the uh, the characters, if you want to play that, that game. And on the right side, there is the technical implementation. So let's let's start from introducing the components. The first one is the fact to the deceiver, right? So the one that says to Kubernetes, I am a node, give me work to do, I'll take care of that. But at the same time, whenever it receives a request, it contact is friends uh, interlink API server that you can consider like the man in the middle because it's responsible to expose the standard uh, APIs that I uh, anticipated before. And then it contact the plugin that has been installed by the provider and where all the logic for submitting Slurm jobs, for example, uh, is uh, concentrated. 
And that is really the, the cavalry, so the one responsible to execute your payloads. And you, if you go on the right side of the slide, you see that essentially you have the Kubernetes API server and all the scheduler and whatever, all the components of the, Kube, of the Kubernetes part are talking to this virtual node, just like any other virtual kubelet that is out there. The only thing that changes is that the virtual kubelet itself is speaking a particular uh, language, if you want, that can be plugged to different kind of plugins. So you can see here the uh, virtual kubelet authenticate to through a token with uh, uh, the API server, and then the plugin does the jobs. We have three implementation at the moment, as I mentioned before. We tested a local Docker component. You have a single machine. You want to uh, run that in, into a Docker. It's more for demo, but also for real uh, cases where you have a big machine. We have Zlurm in, in this box here. That is the one we are going to, to look at. And then we have HT Condo for uh, normal grid system. You have here the schema. I'll let this more uh, for, your, for you as a reference to, to understand the flow. But again, I don't want to repeat myself. You start with a node that is destined to, uh, with a pod that is destined to a, a particular node, to a virtual node. And then from there, it proceed in a, in a chain. So the virtual kubelet contact interlink and say, okay, I need to run this payload, do whatever it takes. And depending on the plugin that is installed, the interlink part does these different things. Where did we test this implementation? So we decided uh, to, to start from volunteer sites and we were lucky enough to have uh, as a first volunteer site, the Vega HPC Center, that is one of the biggest uh, Euro HPC Center. And we were able to play with uh, quite a success uh, at that stage. So we, it, it was really the fact that they enabled us to convince other sites, other people that this could actually work. And related to the discussion of the last time, uh, the last uh, meeting, yeah, for 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 us, this model worked very well. We have a champion, if you want, where we demonstrate things that works. And then, for example, you look at HPC Center that is also participating to Intertwin, come and say, okay, it's quite interesting. We have our way to manage container on our center. Can we plug our uh, work onto this? So we can plug, for example, Unicore, that is their, their framework, into a plugin serving as a backend for interlink. And this is, was the second step, the second fundamental step that demonstrated not only that the old flow can, can work for us, but also that the principle of easily extensible is a valid argument in, in this case. And yeah, so now, unless there are uh, um, questions, the plan is really going through no, demo is a, a, a big word. I, I mean, showing directly what it looks like some meeting pods uh, on uh, on this kind of infrastructure and our the notebook part that I mentioned before is working. So, yeah. I don't, I don't know if anyone has any pressing question that they would like to raise. Feel free to come forward. Uh, yeah, hi, I have just a quick question. Yeah. Um, what kind of, so what provider are you using from Virtual Kubelet? Yeah, the interlink is, if you want, the provider, of, uh, the provider, so the implementation of the, uh, of the Virtual Kubelet is done by us and it leverages the interfaces provided by the virtual kubelet software so so was this sorry i saw ksoc also was that kind of a inspiration for the interlink provider or yeah sure yeah we we took that from the architecture perspective and then we also of course look at around how people manage virtual kubelet and yeah but the, the the class itself is fully virtual kubelet based. It's, it's nothing. It's nothing fancy. Let's say. All right. Thank you.
All right, so let's start from what it looks like for the user in case of interactive analysis. Well, uh, I'm sure most of you uh, uh, knows the interface for Jupyter app. What we do here is selecting the image that is actually in the Vega URHPC center, and the user can select, okay, give me uh, a slot with CPU or GPU and in Vega, and here I'm into the, the login node, where in, into the edge node where we have interlink uh, configured, and you can see that I have nothing running here at the moment, but as soon I, I'm going to create a pod that is pointing to that particular node with, with this flag, you should be able to see, yeah, now it started, you should be able to see that a job, a Slurm job is arriving, and it will actually do a singularity exec. Let me show you. Uh, yeah, no, it takes too much time. Let's see the job running. The notebook uh, is it's up and get uh, and running again. So I'm inside a node in Vega with a jo job in, on the Loom running a Jupyter Lab, and I have. NVIDIA as am I, and I have a GPU available to do all my uh, development stuff. What looks like into, if I go into the, uh, oops, into the node, into the Kubernetes cluster, it's actually, oops, it's actually the following. Okay, are you still with me? Okay, yes, yes. It's not my connection, fortunately. So I can take a look at this and say get pod J app. And you see here that my notebook is essentially a normal pod that has only one constraint, actually. Uh, yes, this YAMO. And the constraint is that I'm asking for node selector. So my, I'm asking to go directly into the, oops, into the Vega node. So you have to be explicit, of course, but if you select the node that is called Vega new virtual kubelet, you will be spawned into a Slurm queue with uh, a singularity container running on top of it. And this works in the this case with a trick. Uh, the job is connecting back through a, a con tunneling a tunnel connection. But in case your payload is not that uh, complicated, you have, for instance, the possibility to do to submit any payload that is going to download that data, collect information, train on that and bring back your results. So I started with the uh, worst, worst case to, to show you the, the whole chain. But again, you can be as fancy as you want unless you, you require PVC that are not uh, supported. You can bring with you config map secrets and uh, empty deer. But and the connection to the internal or the remote Kubernetes cluster is not allowed from the inside of the HPC. You, we, you can think of VPN or, or whatever, but it's, it's not the target of this um, at the moment, at least. So uh, I don't know if you want to lead what uh, comes next. Otherwise, I am just pointing you uh, to the, uh, just showing you the documentation and Oops. So in documentation, we have uh, two scenarios that you can try on your own. The one is that is local. You have both Kubernetes cluster and a Docker Compose on your laptop. And you can check how the components are talking to each other. 
And the other one is actually what we use to the to deploy all the machinery. So we use you have a step by step uh, demo where, for example, for the authentication between the virtual kubelet and the remote counterpart, we we use the OAuth chain that, in particular, in this case, is GitHub. But we have also instruction for everything that is OAuth two compatible. And, and then you install through a, through the client and through some configuration, both the components, the one that goes into the Kubernetes cluster and the one that is responsible to run Zlurm job, for example, remotely. And so, yeah, it takes literally uh, five minutes to, to go through this. But the nice thing that I want to, to stress uh, is that we also, since the specification uh, are uh, documented through Open API, you can implement whatever plugin you want with quite uh, some, some ease. And we also have example example for this, if you want to extend and we'll have people coming and say, OK, I want to extend. Uh, and they get started pretty easily with, with this kind of approach. Um, yeah, just keep in mind that we are at the early stage of this project. So the API is something that we want to fix quite soon, but we are not there. So uh, at the same time, there is a good time if you want to come on board to, to lead what the API will look like in, in the future. But uh, if you want to rely for production ready stuff, it is not at this stage. Um, all right, there are questions. Otherwise, I go back to the presentation. I see Pablo has a raised hand. Go ahead, yeah. Pablo. Yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, thanks for the very interesting presentation. Um, I had two questions, actually. Um, so the first one is, um, I'm not sure I understood uh, that you mentioned the limitations is that you only get like a config map, empty there, et cetera. So what are your, what, what is the approach here if you spawn a notebook that needs access to some, you know, data that is somewhere else? Um, yeah. And then I have a second I was... question that I can maybe ask later. Yeah. Uh... The, the first one is there was partially a lie inside that because you can still access uh, common and scratch area, com not scratch, common area that you can decide to, to mount a singularity uh, time. So for example, you have your scratch area or your data area inside HPC. You can bring data there mm -hmm. through whatever machinery, and then you can still access that. Uh, with via a pod annotation, you can say, okay, mount this area because I'm allowed to. Okay, because it, you're inside the HPC and you, you, yeah. just, you can just mount it. Okay, I see. Uh, but the, for instance, the PVCs, is that a design limitation or is it just the fact that it's not implemented? Well, on one side, it's linked to the fact that we have no internal access to the network of the cluster. Okay, That's, yeah, I see. Um, that, yeah. So that is limiting a lot what we can do what we can do there. And and I suppose it will be many other issues that we, we need to take care of in order to, to allow for that. Okay, thanks. Um the second question might be a bit brief, uh, hopefully. Um I was just wondering, so I'm 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 not an expert on the internals of the notebook, but it was quite interesting that you showed an interactive session. I was just wondering how the connection is established since obviously you don't know which node it's gonna end up running at. Yeah, with worker node. So I was wondering how it works behind the scenes, how you can establish that interactive connection. Yeah, with again vision from a bit uh, far away, we are instrumenting the Jupyter Lab image uh, with um, a, an initial script where you connect through with your Jupyter uh, Lab or Jupyter Hub token back in a SSH. Uh, session with the Jupyter Hub. So you open a, a tunnel basically to the Jupyter Hub. And then you start communic communicating with the proxy on the cluster, the Jupyter Hub proxy on the cluster uh, through through this tunnel. So yeah, not every okay, image can work on that, but it's really a, a script that you have to put in the initialization of the Docker to, to adapt yeah. any Jupyter Lab image to, to work in this way. 
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. I have uh, uh, C. Rohinia. Go ahead. Um. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Diego. That was that was that was really a good presentation. Um, an overview. Um, yeah, I had just, a question. Sorry. Yeah. No. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Just just to clarify, I have just a couple of slides to to conclude. But yeah, go on, go ahead. So. Okay. <laughs> um, I had a question about the 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 OAuth chain um, in the sense that is it is something that's implied here that the IDP that you've configured your Jupyter Hub with there is an implicit level of trust with the HPC facility that the JHub tokens will be will be trusted or is that established? No, the only trust that oh, oops the only trust uh, that comes from this implementation is at the moment you can have finer grain for example in the Julik implementation we have the grain of authorization that is on the pod level so the pod has to be has to present an annotation with a user access token to be trusted and to be executed on the on the slur node but generally speaking the general implementation uh, relies on the fact that the kubernetes cluster that is talking to the interlink api is trusted by the hpc so the hpc trust the interlink server as a group account if you want to to put it in this way so the administrator of the edge machine trust whatever comes from the kubernetes cluster so there is trust between the cluster administrator and the provider administrator okay if this is not enough again you can ask at the plugin level from for whatever additional uh information you need to allow the user to submit to the to the queue for example if you want to allow only certain people, you can plug here a mechanism for say, okay, if this pod arrives with valid uh, credentials, it's allowed to, to run. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And I guess that's 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 true independent of what the entry point is. So here in the demo, the entry point was Jupyter Hub for the pods, but if even if it is yeah. coming from some other data processing way, the fact that the trust is between the interlink server and the HPC means that, okay, yeah. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Awesome. Uh, Dennis, do you want to go next? We'll give you the chance to finish after you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Diego, for the for the great presentation. Just uh, one quick question. This is maybe a little bit use case specific, but do you support having multiple containers in a single pod when deployed onto the HPC infrastructure? And what will Interlink do with networking and shared memory in that case? Because we have a use case where we would really benefit from deploying essentially two separate components at the same time in a single pod, sharing resources. Yeah. So in in that case, again, it's not really Interlink internal because what the information of uh, multi-container pods is transformed into into what is managed at the plugin level. So currently there's Loom plugin that we use at Vega, for example, uh, that's the following. Allocate a Loom job with the sum of the requests for, for the container and then uh, kickstart two singularity process, one for each container in the single job. Okay. So th this grants you at least to land on the uh, same node and do and do some stuff. It's not the, the cleanest possible way that you want to you, you would want to to work with. But again, if you're interested in doing you know, better or less some use cases, you you're more than welcome to to join the, the effort. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I think you can go ahead, Diego, and wrap it up. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So. I wanted to share also that uh, we were a, a bit worried about the, the scale 
um, as always, but they, it ended up in being a, a nice experience uh, all in all. You can see here a plot where there are uh, 1,000 pods uh, deployed. It's not enough, but it's not uh, too, too less, I, I suppose, uh, resulting in 10K cores uh, consumed by, in this case, we leverage some example workflows from, from CMS collaboration. And yeah, so we, and all of them, all the 1,000 uh, pods uh, were managed by a Kubernetes cluster that is really uh, a common one, if uh, a common uh, one exists at all. But yeah, there were no dedicated hardware or special uh, stuff that uh, we did to to reach super high performance from the control plane side, let's say. So that, that was a, a good news for, for us. And also this is to, to mention that we, are developing and we develop the, this tool also with, with this in mind. So we are trying our best not to uh, create a lot of requests to the, for example, plugins. So in the case of Zloom, a lot of uh, SQ command, but rather trying to catch whatever possible and be on the lazier part more than in, on the uh, aggressive part in terms of uh, synchronizing the, the statuses. So. This will allow for sure uh, to, to scale and as an important role on, on this uh, achievement, if you want. So uh, all in all, we have this deal in, in mind. We keep and um, provide maintenance as a community for the core part of the virtual kubelet. So uh, communication, authentication, authorization model, and the API that goes through the communication, the remote part to the entry part of the edge node, the caching of the state and whatever. And, and then we hope for interesting party to uh, give a stab to providing uh, the implementation that they want to uh, in their use cases. And um, yeah. Talking of which, we have experience also outside HPCs that are interested in this. So for instance, you have services for which would be hard for you to give Kubernetes access to, to them. But uh, with this uh, trick, you can create your plugin and say, look, uh, with this, you can uh, make a call to a Kubernetes cluster, to a Kubernetes control plane, and have your things deployed on, on my uh, SaaS, for example. So that's uh, one model that is uh, taking a bit of attraction, attraction, and that is uh, bringing us to uh, thinking: okay, how we we should evolve from from here uh, if other parties are interested in maintaining and collaborating. And uh, also, so a paper is in the writing, and for reference, the sign and implementation and very first experience that we have so so far. Um, yeah, I think we touched uh, most of, of this point. Let me stress, uh, stress just again that we are not using only Zloom for implementation. We have a lot of other use cases that uh, are running on the heterogeneous set of resources that we have uh, in FN and in Italy in general. So we are also um, working on, on that level. If you are interested in uh, making questions or whatever, you can join the Slack channel for uh, that we have for the community and for the project inside Intertween. And uh, last but not least, the you know, link to the documentation is here, but it's also in the description of the event. So you, you can go whatever route you, you prefer. And um, yeah, that's all. Thank you very much, Diego. That was pretty, that was awesome. Um, I, I was gonna ask you if you can share also in the agenda uh, of the group the the links both to the presentation and to yeah, the sure. to the documentation. I think that would be very useful for people checking it later. Uh, we have time for more questions. So I see Kevin. Um. Uh, yeah, I was just, it's an interesting project. I was curious if you all have considered adding this as a provider to the Virtual Cubelet website to kind of bring more awareness to 
how you can use virtual kubelet. Yeah, that that's a good point. Uh, we we did we uh, haven't reached yet the the level which okay we knock at the door and say you we want to to be published there. But yeah, I I think it's worth uh, appearing there to be to be aware of this possibility. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, if you look at a lot of the providers, yeah. part of it is, I think, uh, health of the project. Because when I look at Virtual Kubelet, I a lot of those providers are pretty old. So it makes it seem like that project is not really continuing. So I think, like, at least have it showing the, in the open source community that you are using this kind of shows that it's still actively, people are still actively using it. Yeah, so, good point. Even if, like, it's, you know, about you quote unquote, think it's rough. <laughs> I, no, 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 I, I no. was actually thinking about this a year ago and I, I wasn't aware of this project at the time. So I, I, it's just like having that information because I, when I looked at Virtual Kubelet, I saw there was a CRI provider and I was like, oh, if I want Slurm and CRI, I'll have to implement my own. And I kind of, I stopped. <laughs> no. So. And it's a similar story I heard also from other people. So yeah, okay. Yeah, I think I think that's a good point. Uh, that's a, a good way for people to find the project. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Well, if people think I'll ask one. Um, what are the resource requirements on the interlink cluster in the origin cluster? Is it just like the etcd resources, or is there anything else? You mean from the control plane yeah. perspective? Yeah. Well, I can say that for the scale test, again, it's not a lot, but it, it's something really we had ATCD running on not even, I think. My a, understanding not is not an SSD, let's say. So on a whatever kind, uh, really normal control plane reach this kind of, of performances. Because again, uh, it's lighter for what we, we saw so far is from the intensity of the of the work is really less intensive than having uh, uh, real nodes and real pod. But yeah, it's we need to, to measure this. But so far, if you want to reach at least 1,000 pod, you don't need any particular requirements other yeah, than- Yeah, this is assuming I didn't get it completely. If the yeah. if the interlink metadata on the virtual kubelet node is that stored in etcd or do you have your own storage? Uh, uh, so the the state are um, all the information are stored inside the pods uh, resources. So eventually are in the etcd of the Kubernetes cluster. So it's not in, it's nothing dedicated. What you have inside instead is the cache that has done it on the remote part. So the interlink part does inside uh, a, a cache of the statuses, allowing for not going each time the Kubernetes cluster requests a status to go ask the Slurm. If it's running uh, for a certain period of time, I cache the, that information. And then eventually I, I update the, the cache later. So just to avoid bombarding the Slurm services with too many requests. Okay, thank you. And I had one more, uh, let's see any of the questions. So there was a question already about the network re requirements, but uh, I had another one, which is at the scheduling time, because I understand this is at the pod level. Uh, so for example, if you want to do some sort of, say distributed training for ML and you want to co-locate pods, um, this would mean like co-location is just basically putting the same node name in the other annotation, which is the virtual kubelet, and then you just assume you're running on the same HPC farm and somehow you will have like fast interconnects, all these things. Is this correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, there is something that is interesting, but we didn't have practical use case to, to test with. That is the MPI uh, configuration. So in principle, you can pass to the annotation to the pods, 
whatever option you can pass manually from the HPC login node to the Slurm submission uh, command. So in principle, you should be able to configure your job, your different pods to, to leverage MPI of the sites, all the, all the machinery for, for that kind. But we, we haven't uh, yet have a use case that is willing to, to test that. So it's just okay. a wide guess. All right, and I'll ask the last one, and then I'll, I'll pass the yeah. others. But if I would use um, um, a library for, say, machine learning or anything else that uh, does distributed um, pods and training, uh, how does this uh, translate to, have you tried this, like, for example, doing TensorFlow distributed and then seeing what happens? Yeah, we, we did end up try the distributed part with uh, TensorFlow, for, for instance. Uh, different thing is if you want to have, uh, if you have some service that you want to set up, uh, for instance, I'm thinking of MFflow tracking server, you can expose that. And in case of Vega, you can contact that for, for tracking your machine learning uh, performances. Uh, but yeah, doing actually the, the real um, multi node, if you want, training is not something that we test. But if you're willing to, or with some use cases, yeah, that would be. But, would be but for example, the virtual yeah. kubelet, how many resources does it advertise to the scheduler? Is it like unlimited? And you assume there's unlimited quota on the back end? So the, the node. The node itself uh, can be either unlimited if you want to allow for any kind of uh, Slurm submission uh, to to the virtual node, but otherwise you can instantiate uh, a flat static uh, resources when you install the virtual kubelet. So you can make that that node appear like uh, allowing for 10k pods and for to 20 terabytes of RAM and so on and so forth. So typically yeah. you would have like one virtual kubelet per queue to have control like this or? Yeah, it's up to the, to the use case and the topology you want to achieve. But yes, if you want, the, the easiest case is, okay, I'll let Slurm limit my usage. So the virtual kubelet, virtual node is unlimited. Okay, yeah. yep, makes sense. Other questions? I'm watching for raised yeah, hands. Just to follow up on that one. So yeah, go ahead. if you are submitting a pod and you hit Slurm, I guess would the pod show up as just running at the Kubernetes level and then in Slurm it would actually be enqueued? No. No, no, no. The the status uh, is one of the things that is managed centrally by the virtual kubelet and it rely, relies on the status uh, retrieved from Slurm. So uh, until the pod is not running, it, it, yeah, the container is not running inside the job, the Slurm job, the pod status remain pending. Okay. If, the, if for any reason the submission failed, you have provider failed, something like that. And yeah, but you do, you do not see running if the job is not running. Okay, thank you. Very, very nice. So we are getting to four minutes from the end. So we have time for one more question, if someone has one. Otherwise, uh, thank you so much, Diego. This was really good. Uh, I suggest uh, if people have additional questions, so we can also follow it up in the in the Slack channel for, for the research user group. I know uh, Diego is also there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, feel free to to uh, to ask questions there. And follow up on the discussion. So, uh, quick. Re uh, I don't know if anyone has any other thing to raise. All right. Otherwise, uh, our next scheduled meeting is currently May uh, the second one in May. So the first one we don't have uh, a speaker yet, but it's very likely that we'll find one. So um, yeah. See you in two weeks, and uh, thanks, thanks again for for participating. Bye. -bye. Thanks very Thank much. Bye. That was great. Thank you.